Okay, Revelation chapter 2, verses 8 through 11. If you're there, let me know by saying, Jesus loves church. Jesus loves church. Okay, that's really true. Who, who are the church? Do you know? Yeah, he loves us. I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful to be a part of us, to be a part of a community that Jesus is dedicated to. Um, briefly, before we get into today's teaching, we made this announcement last Sunday, but if it's helpful for you to kind of navigate the content that is shared here verbally, we call that a sermon or a teaching, but you'd like to navigate that content visually. If you go to this website link in your browser, oh, not that one, um, that one, there it is. Oh, there it is, coastlinegulfbreeze.com, Revelation 2022. If you go to that link and you just tap it and go for it, you'll see a, a home screen that looks like one, two, this right here. And this will give you an opportunity to kind of see the teaching notes that um, I use on a Sunday morning to teach from. Um, if that's something that's helpful. If it's not, you're like, man, I'm just here to snooze, to sleep. My, my spouse dragged me here. I ain't paying attention. Well, God bless you, bro. Um, but if it is something that's helpful, that's available to you, or they're available in print form at the Connect desk. Okay, Jesus loves church. We're in what would, many would call the second section of the book of Revelation. Revelation is so helpful because it comes with a divine outline. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 19, you see an outline that is given to the Apostle John of how the book unfolds. Chapter 1 are the things that John saw. Let me write this stuff down. Chapters 2 and 3 are the things that are happening at the time that John is alive. And then chapters 4 through 22 are that which is to come. That's the divine outline of Revelation. And Revelation is amazing. Specifically, this second section where Jesus, his love to and for and about the church is revealed. Because love can be kind of an ambiguous thing, can it? And when you say Jesus loves the church, you say, well, what does that mean? Jesus' love is tough and tender timely and thorough. And here in chapter 2, his love is revealed to us. You don't have to live in ambiguity of what it means to be loved by Jesus. Revelation, revealing, is the centerpiece of this book. And we know from chapter 1, verse 1, that revealing Jesus and the things that must soon take place, as the language says there in Revelation 1.1, that's the focal point of this book. You see, in chapters 2 and 3, where we are today, we're walking through seven letters, seven messages to seven churches. And there's four things just to keep in your, oh, I don't know, your backlog, your mind's eye, I guess, to take note of concerning these churches. These were real, actual, historical seven churches that existed in modern-day Turkey. And if you wonder, is that a real country, modern-day Turkey? Well, you can go talk to Scott and Sylvia Shepard. They just spent a month in Turkey. They'll tell you all about it. It's a real place. I hear they don't celebrate Christmas. Is that true? Turkish? They don't. I don't know. I heard about it, but I don't know if that's real. Does not matter. Number two, these letters give clarity to the love that Jesus has. It's tough. It's tender. It's timely. It's thorough. It's commending. It's cautionary content-oriented. There's teaching. There's critiquing. These letters are universal and personal. What does that mean? How many of you do have two eyes and two ears this morning? Okay. Throughout these letters, you'll hear Jesus say to those that have ears, check to see if you qualify. Yeah. Now that's kind of tongue-in-cheek, right? He's meaning if you have a sensitivity to his spirit. But also there's this dynamic that this word is for you. Look, I don't know everything there is to know about you. I know many of you. But I know the one who knows you. I know the one who designed you. I know the one who knows your days. And I know that this book is intended for you. But you have to listen. 
I have a friend that, very gifted Bible teacher, he always used to say this, Neil, if you want God's blessing in your life to flow, you've got to be under the spout where the blessing's coming out. You can't be over here. You got to be right here where it's coming, bro. Be there. So this is what that means. God has something for you this morning in this text, if you're willing to listen. But he is the perfect gentleman. He will not force himself upon you. God doesn't need you. He wants you. He wants you. He wants a relationship with you. But that's going to take an element of you volitionally connecting with him. Listen, these letters are universal and personal. And fourthly and finally, these letters follow a similar pattern. This is things that we learned last week. Number one, you'll see each letter opens with an identification to where the church resides. This morning, we'll see in Revelation chapter 2, verse 8, that he'll say, to the angel of the church in Smyrna. Okay, that's where they are. Number two, we're given kind of an insightful or relevant description or characterization of Jesus that relates to the message that he's going to share with that church. And often he gives a commendation. He comes with encouragement. And then if appropriate, he gives a warning, a critique, a complaint of something going on. Often that's followed by a command, an instruction of how to get right and stay right, counsel and caution of things to avoid, and then he closes again with comfort. This is the pattern of these seven letters to these seven churches. In some of the letters, you see every single like step just checked right off. Some, they're a little bit shuffled. Some, he skips over a step or two, but there's intentionality to each one. So let's consider the second church that Jesus wrote a letter to, the church in Smyrna. Revelation chapter 2, verses 8 through 11, and we're going to walk through how Jesus reveals his love to this church and to you. Verse 8 through 11, coming from the New Living Translation, this is what the Word of God says. Write this letter to the angel of the church in Smyrna. This is the message from the one who is the first and the last, who was dead but is now alive. I know about your suffering and your poverty, but you are rich. I know the blasphemy of those who are opposing you. They say they are Jews, but they are not because their synagogue belongs to Satan. Don't be afraid of what you're about to suffer. The devil will throw some of you into prison to test you. You will suffer for 10 days. But if you remain faithful, even when facing death, I will give you the crown of life. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. Whoever is victorious will not be harmed by the second death. (laughs) Father, I pray as our Bibles are open that our hearts and ears would be the same. Lord, speak to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Seven elements to each of these letters. The first is where this church is located. Smyrna. What's Smyrna? Well, today, it's actually a city in Turkey known as Izmir. It's about 35 miles north of Ephesus, and at that time was known as the crown of Asia for its natural beauty. Did any of you guys go outside yesterday and see that emerald green water? That was amazing. Amazing. On the bay side, the sound side, the gulf side. Beautiful. You go to Smyrna, and it's not like you go... Man, are they making paper over here? Like, what does that smell like? Like, no, no, no. It's like, when you're there, you're like, this is beautiful. This is gorgeous. I like this place. But it was deeply committed to idolatry and to the worship of Roman emperors. Now, if you know your Bibles at all, I mean, I I find this extremely interesting. You know, when Jesus walked the earth, it did not seem... Like that dynamic of emperor worship was as predominant 
as it was in the first and second century of the early church. And I want to encourage you, and I may do this when I, if I have opportunities and as I have opportunities to teach on Sunday morning, to just give you different references to check out. And I'd love to encourage you to, to constantly frequent EnduringWord.com by David Guzik. He gave such great insight into this dynamic of Smyrna and how this city was given over to idolatry and how emperor worship became a thing. He said this, and I thought it was interesting. I just wanted to share it with you. He said it was actually in 196 BC that the first temple dedicated to the worship of the spiritual symbol of the Roman Empire was built in Smyrna. So this city kind of showed up on the scene as one of the first ones to kind of have a bit of nationalism. Do you know what that is? Where it's God, gun, guts, and glory. Where it's like Jesus is... American, like some Christians are there. Does that make sense? Like they're nationalists. It's really what they are. And that's kind of what happened here with Smyrna. They're like, we're Roman. And listen to what Guzik says. He says, in the days of Jesus, emperor worship was not predominant. Yet once the spirit of Rome was worshiped, it wasn't much of a step to worship the dead emperors of Rome. Then it was only another small step to worship the living emperors and then to demand such worship as evidence of political allegiance and civic pride. He says in A.D. 23, Smyrna won the privilege to build the first temple to worship Caesar. The Roman Emperor Domitian, 81 to 96 A.D., was the first to demand that people call him Lord as a test of their political loyalty. Emperor worship had begun as a spontaneous demonstration of gratitude to Rome, but toward the end of the first century, the final step was taken, and Caesar worship became compulsory. Once a year, a Roman citizen must take a burnt, a pitch of incense on an altar of the godhead of Caesar, and having done so, he was given a certificate to guarantee that he had performed his religious duty. He says that all the Christians had to do was to to burn a little pinch of incense and say, Caesar is Lord, get their certificate, and then go away and worship as they pleased. But see that, and this is what Guzik says, I love what he says here, but that is precisely what Christians would not do. They would give no man the name of Lord, that name they would keep for Jesus Christ and him alone. They would not even formally conform. Meaning there were some who could say, well, if you just pay the right amount of money, they'll just give you this certificate. You don't even have to say it. But you'll get a certificate that says that you did. Just do that. And the government will leave you alone. And the church in Smyrna said, I'm not doing that. I'm worshiping Jesus. And that's where it ends. There's a lot that could be said about this with the current context of our world. But I'll let the word of God continue to speak as we walk through this and see how Jesus responds to that. They say, yeah, just pay and get the certificate. I don't want you to have a troubled life. Listen to what he says. Keep staying with me on this message. It's a tough setting for Christians. They were called to lay down their comfort, their social status, their safety, and their security for solidarity in Jesus. See, here's the deal. The Smyrna church was poor, persecuted, eventually to be imprisoned, but they were tenacious. They knew how to persevere. And Jesus gives them a promise. Now, who is the angel, the the messenger, or maybe the pastor of the church in Smyrna? As we know, angel means messenger. Another reference I would love to recommend is a book by Pastor Chuck Smith. He has this great little commentary on the book of Revelation, and I wanted to read to you what he said about this messenger at the time that this letter was written. He says this, if the word angel refers to the local bishop or pastor of the church, well, the bishop of Smyrna was Polycarp. Anyone ever heard of Polycarp? Okay, a couple people. Polycarp was the disciple of John. This was the individual that John invested his life into and passed ministry onto. 
He was martyred in the 90s, not the 1990s, like the 90s, like the old school, the OG, the original 90s. And the government planned to kill this aged man by burning him at the stake, Pastor Chuck says. As the wood was gathered around him, the executioner said, I hate to see an old man die. Just recant Christ and we'll set you free. And Polycarp said this, for over 80 years I have served my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Not once has he ever denied me. I shall not deny him. And the executioner said, the fire will be hot. And Polycarp said, not nearly as hot as the fire you'll experience. <laughs> and the executioner lit the kindling. And at first the flames leaped up around Polycarp, but this is what church history records. But it didn't touch his body. Seeing this, the executioner took a spear and thrust it through him, and the blood that poured out extinguished the fire. And the Christians took his body and gave him a Christian burial. And this is how he closes this out. He says, It is significant in a church whose members should suffer persecution and tribulation and have many martyred that even the bishop, the leader of the church, was put to death. The early leader was not above the people he ministered to. He shared in the trials and in the sufferings of his flock. The church in Smyrna was a persecuted church. Again, for even fuller context to the story of Polycarp, I'd recommend you checking out EnduringWord.com. David Guzik even gives a lot more context to the other Christians that were killed when Polycarp was martyred. It's a fascinating story. But it's amazing. Because the insightful, relevant characterization that Jesus gives, he says, I'm the first and the last. I'm the one who was dead, but now alive. Why does he say this? See, the name Smyrna, the name of the town, means bitter. It's related to the word myrrh. Do you remember when Jesus was given three gifts? Anyone remember that, the Magi? It actually happened potentially a couple years after his birth. It's not like Jesus was born, and within like the first 90 minutes, they were ready for the gift. You ever feel pressure to do that? Like someone has a baby, like, where's the gift? Like, man, I have kids. My, I... But anyway, the Magi showed up like two years later. I like that. That's good. Let's maybe get that, that system rolling. But the Magi showed up two years later with gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Gold, Jesus was born king of the Jews. Represents his royalty. Frankincense, expensive incense, that Jesus is our high priest. Reflects his deity. Myrrh is a spice that was used in the preparation of a body for burial. Some would say this reflects his humanity. And myrrh is a spice that was used in preparation for the body when they had died. Here's the interesting thing about myrrh. The fragrance is only produced when it is crushed. And Jesus is most beautiful to us because he went to the cross on your behalf and mine. See, in communion this morning, that's what we're celebrating. Jesus, you died my death. You were crushed, you were bruised, you were beaten. And out of that came this fragrance of forgiveness. See, Smyrna, the name and location reminds us of the suffering that that church would endure. And it's in the crushing, in the suffering, that the aroma and the impact of the church is most fragrant. Another resource I'd recommend to you is a book called Unlocking the Last Days. And the author of this book says this. In Isaiah chapter 60, we read a description of Jesus reigning in the thousand-year millennial kingdom on earth after the tribulation period. And Isaiah speaks of people coming from everywhere, bringing gold and incense and proclaiming the praises of the Lord. They'll bring gold, they'll bring incense, but they won't bring myrrh because Jesus never suffered and died again. He was dead, but now he is alive. See, Jesus identifies himself to this suffering church as I'm the first and I'm the last. 
I'm the one who was dead but now is alive. What does this mean? Jesus, first and last, position and power. That's who King Jesus is. Revelation is revealing to us more of Jesus in his glorified state. Do you remember Matthew chapter 28? When Jesus gave you your life's job description. Go therefore and make disciples. Before he gives you that commission, he tells you who he is. That I have the keys to the kingdom. The keys to authority on heaven and on earth. Jesus is the first and the last. There's position and power. But he's also the one who was dead and now alive. What does that mean? He can be present in your pain. And there's promise. Listen to what the author says about Jesus in the book of Hebrews chapter 4. He says, So then, since we have a great high priest who has entered into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, Let us hold firmly to what we believe. Why? This high priest of ours, please listen to this, understands our weaknesses. For he faced all of the same testings we do. It didn't sin. So let us come boldly to the throne of our most gracious God. There we will receive mercy. and We will find grace to help us when we need it most. Smyrna, and we'll see this in just a few moments as we kind of consider the commendation that Jesus gives to this church. They were poor. They were persecuted. And Jesus, in his position, in his power, in his presence, in his promise, he simply says this, I know. You know, there's some hurts that some people will never know. Some things that have happened to you or through you. They said, I'd like to just leave that alone. And Jesus says, I know. I'm there. I was tempted in every way. I understand your weakness. See, here's the great thing about the gospel of Jesus Christ. I think I take this for granted. God is accessible to me. He understands me. He's willing to be present with me. And there's things that I can trust him with that I can't trust to anyone else. And that's what the church in Smyrna needed to hear. They're going through the thick of trial. And what does Jesus say? Just pull yourself up by those bootstraps. Grin and bear it. Make it work. Fake it till you make it. There's an element of perseverance, and we'll see that in a moment. But here's the first thing he says. I know. I know. See, we live in a world where everything on this side of eternity is broken. There are broken images of family everywhere. Broken governance, broken communities, broken churches. No church is perfect. And when you're wronged or when you're slighted or when you're overlooked or when you go through difficult times, you kind of, does anyone see? And here's what you need to know. Let me see your eyes. He knows. He's there with you. He's the one who can empathize with your weakness. So maybe instead of talking to everyone else about the situation, talk to the one who knows. Spend time with him. And trust him. Trust him. Trust him to work justice as he sees fit. Trust him to work his will in his way. In his timing. See, this is the commendation that Jesus gives to a poor and persecuted church. I know. See, the poverty that's described here is that of being destitute. I mean, I heard someone say it this way. 
there's poor, and then there's po. Do you know what I mean by that? Where you feel like, man, I, am, I can't even finish the word. That's how poor I am. You know, like, that is this group of people. Can't rub two nickels together. They're in an area that's affluent. But because of their stance for Jesus, they're poor. And Jesus says, but you're rich. Persecution. He says in verse 9, I know the blasphemy of those opposing you. They say they are Jews, but they're not because their synagogue belongs to Satan. See, here's the crazy thing going on in that culture. There was a large Jewish community that thrived in Smyrna at the time. And their religious practices were permitted by Rome. Now, the Jews certainly weren't favorable to Christians, thus not truly following Yahweh. But as Jesus would say here, Satan. Thus, from both the Jew and the Gentiles, the Christians in Smyrna received slander and suffering. And here's the thing I want you to get. The church was challenged, was going through challenging times, and honestly, even more challenging times were coming. And what does Jesus say? Don't worry, I'm coming to the rescue. Daddy's going to protect you from ever feeling hurt. No. He says, I know. I know. That's what he says. When I'm going through challenge, when I, he doesn't just come and like remove the challenge. He says, I know. Now, it's interesting here. He doesn't give a critique or a complaint to this church. And I think there's a lesson here in love that love needs to be timely. And I think I would do well to learn this, that sometimes you can do the right thing at the wrong time and it makes it the wrong thing. Does that make sense? Like one of my children this week um, did something wrong. Can you believe that? And then this individual made it right. And this was unbeknownst to my wife and I. We didn't know that the wrong had happened. And we didn't know that the conviction of the Holy Spirit was brought upon this child and that this child responded and actually confessed. And I was amazed that the child came and said, here's what I did last week. Um, here's what I did to make it right. And I need you to know. And I thought, this is not the time for retribution. Well, how dare you do? This was the time to go, at least for us. And you can come email me later and tell me what we did wrong. But <laughs> like, for us, this is like, hey, you, you, you listened to God's spirit and you course corrected. That's good. Because that's who we all are. And so this person, I said, you get another dollar on your allowance this week. And the, the kid was like, yes, I'm going to do right more. I'll steal again or do this wrong. No, no, no. Like, uh, <laughs> but like, just this dynamics of timeliness, timeliness, timeliness. The church there is going through H-E double hockey sticks, right? It's tough. Jesus doesn't come and go, oh, by the way, you owe me five bucks for that cheeseburger. No, he doesn't come and like provide critique when someone is walking through challenge. I think that's a good social lesson for many of us. But you have no idea what, what you have no idea about with people. Be, be maybe slow to speak, quick to hear. You ever heard that anywhere? It's called the Bible. It's in there. It's good stuff. Like slow to speak, quick to listen. No complaint is given, but there is a command in verse 10. Look at it. In verse 10, he says before in verse 9, I know. Now, what does he say in verse 10 to do? Lord, how am I going to get out of this challenge? Here's what he says. Do not fear. The 1990s? Like, no fear? That's what you're telling me? See, often when faced with challenge, we can fall into the fight, flight, freeze, or fear dynamic. Have you ever heard that statement? That do not fear is mentioned 365 times in the Bible. Anyone ever heard that? I, you know, that may be true. There's an article out there that says, is it true that the words do not afraid happen 365 times in the Bible? And I read through the article, and I like some of the elements that this author brought. And this author said this. Here's some of the phrases you do find in the Bible. 302 times in 129 verses, fear not. Okay. 
33 times in seven verses, do not be afraid. Once it says, be anxious for nothing. 66 times, do not fear. 24 times, do not worry. Three times, I will not fear. One time, whom shall I fear? Two times, I will not be afraid. And 99 times, do not be dismayed. The author says there's overlap. And I haven't included every fearless encouragement. Some things are in the positive, like be of good courage. It's kind of saying the same thing, but in a different way. Be brave. But here's the thing to to take note of. This concept, this idea, is the most repeated command in all of the Bible. And perhaps the most uncommon trait in most Christians. Do not fear. Why? Because the one who is dead, who is now alive, wrote you a letter. The first and the last is on your team. The one who designed you and knows how the days will end is with you. So where is anxiety in that? Where is fear? It should not be. Do not fear. Everything that will happen today truly is filtered by your heavenly Father. There's purpose to it. There's intentionality. Not everything that happens today is to make you feel like everything is head high and glassy. That's not the, that's not the like, goal of life. The goal of God for you is not that your days get better, but that you do. Does that make sense? He's seeking to develop you. And some days what's needed is dark days to make you better. And God loves you enough to allow those. And he doesn't say, I'm here to get rid of the dark days. He's here to say, I know. Do not fear. See, in my opinion, what's needed for many of us, I'll just say this for me, is not more information and more insight. It's more community, more encouragement, more consistency with the right content. Does that make sense? Illustration. We, uh, we can put this on the screen now. We had another blue this one right here. That was very fast. That's awesome. Um, rhythms. I was somewhere this week, I can't really remember, and somebody mentioned, I can't remember how this came together, but someone mentioned, I remember a sermon you gave years ago about gospel rhythms, about living a life that's rhythmic. And I used to have this statement, and and I'll just read it to you, I, I wrote it down. In your spiritual life, you're left with one of two choices, random or rhythmic. In everything you do, you can choose to be random or rhythmic. Random, we know this physically, right, produces irregularity. Rhythms produce regularity and fruit, and there's nothing spiritual about random. Gather, group, and go. Commit to that. I'm going to gather with God's people. I'm going to group with God's people. And every day when I go, I'm going to live on mission. I'm going to preach the gospel to myself. Remind myself of who God is. I'm just going to grow. I'm not going to graduate from Christianity 101. I'm going to read my Bible. I'm going to pray. I'm going to tell people about Jesus. I'm going to give of my time, talent, treasure. I'm actually going to serve people. And I'm going to live today in light of that day. I'll give you some G's for this because that's I'm an addicted alliterator. Here it is. Like as an individual, there's four G's. I live for God's glory through the gospel. I commit to growth, and I know one day I'll be gone. I'm going to live in that rhythm every day. And then as a community, three more G's. I'm going to gather, I'm going to group, and I'm going to go. Why do I say that? When you focus on the goal, you never get there. But when you focus on the rhythm to get to the goal, you get there. At the right time, in the right way, and you're right. Rhythms. Living in a healthy way. They used to call that spiritual disciplines, or they used to call that a disciple. That's where the word comes from, disciplined. Like 
if you'll just commit your life to living healthy. Say, how do you do that? This little bifold is a way for us to try and explain. This is what we do at Coastline. This is how we gather together, why we do it, how we do it, how do we know that we've done it. This is what we do when we group. This is what we do when we go. This is the vision we feel like God's given us for the next 20 or 30 years in this area just to see this area served well. When you commit to rhythms spiritually, what do you find? Man, I'm not, I don't have so much time to be afraid of anymore. And these rhythms of being daily in the Word, wouldn't it be awesome if a church provided a way for you to get into God's Word every day? With like, Yeah. When you get into these kind of rhythms, daily in the Word, grouping with community, gathering with God's people, protects your heart. Because I don't know if you remember this. I think it was this congregation. I shared a message recently about the enemy that we have. That he's like a serpent seeking to deceive, and he's like a lion seeking to devour. So what should you do about that? Be worried? No. But here's what I find about the enemy. He's still going to attack no matter what. But as I live life in those spiritual disciplines, with God's people, and as an individual, God's solidifying my heart, head, and hands. There's an element where he's strengthening me. See, the church in Smyrna is about to go through it for 10 epochs of time even. And what does Jesus say to do? I'm coming for you. I'm getting you out of there. I don't want you to have any bad days. He says, I know and don't fear. So what should we do when we don't know what to do? We should do the things that we know to do when we don't know what to do. For the things that we do that we know to do will help us when we don't know what to do. Does that make sense? It will. If you do the things you know to do, when things happen and you don't know what to do, then you know what to do. Do the things you know to do. Gather with God's people, group with God's people, go with God's people. And as an individual, live for the glory of God. You will be tempted tomorrow to live for the glory of something or someone else. Don't fall into that trap. Let the gospel be what defines your paradigm. And just keep growing. I'm reading my Bible, I'm praying, I'm telling people about Jesus. Everything I do, I'm doing it enthusiastically under the Lord. You don't graduate from that stuff. And if you do, then you've failed. <laughs> you don't graduate from Christianity 101. See, then here comes the council. Don't worry, we're at point number six. There's only seven points. We're almost done. Here's the council. Look at verse 10. Don't be afraid of what you're about to suffer. The devil will throw some of you into prison to test you. You will suffer for 10 days, but if you remain faithful when facing death, I will give you the crown of life. It's like Jesus says, here's what's coming for you, and I'm going to give you a crown. I'm going to give you a crown. That works for a three-year-old. I've learned that. Hey, here's what we're doing, and here's what comes at the end of the day, chocolate, or like whatever it is. Like, and, and Jesus kind of follows the same suit, like good communication. I love Jesus as a leader, because he communicates. So here's what's coming. Here's what's coming. You're about to suffer. Well, at least you told me. That's helpful. The devil is coming for you. You're going to be imprisoned and tested, and you will suffer. That's what he says. It'll be for 10 days. Oh, that's very specific. Like, what does that mean? It could be an idiomatic expression. You know what that means? Like, hang loose or like, if the creek don't rise. These are idioms. These are sayings that we kind of understand. It's possible that in that language and at that time that that phrase was as a normal expression to mean this won't be forever. It's possible. It's also possible, it's interesting, that there were 10 periods of intense persecution during the Smyrna period that were known by their Roman emperors. If you're interested in those epochs of time, you can reference the notes, but from Nero to Diocletian, AD 64 to AD 312, Christians were targeted intensely. Perhaps that's what Jesus means. And you may say, that seems like a long time. Listen to what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who's able to destroy both soul and body in hell. 
Here's what's coming for you, persecution. But he says, I will give you the crown of life. These Christians were poor, persecuted, imprisoned, persistently persevering. And here's what Jesus says. I'm urging you to faithfulness and a promised crown for those who stand fast. I got to be honest with you, like, this doesn't sell books, like this kind of message. Like, when we go, man, stuff is tough. Give me some verses about that it's not going to be tough anymore. In the end, it will be. But sometimes things get worse before they get better. I don't know if you've read Revelation, but that's what that kind of says. Like, if you look at chapters 6 and 7 and 8 and 9 and 10 and 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, you go, wow. There's some stuff that's coming. The Bible speaks of heavenly crowns. If you're interested in what those are, you can reference the notes. There are two different words for the word crown in ancient Greek language. One is described that a king or a person of royalty would wear, a diadem. The other is stephanos, used here as like a trophy that a winning athlete would win. Or, you know, I found this interesting. I learned this this week. Or also a Stephanos was often worn at marriage ceremonies and special celebrations. There's a tenderness there. The promise of the crown was especially meaningful for the Christians in Smyrna because pagan worshipers wore crowns, good citizens wore crowns, winning athletes wore crowns, and Jesus looks at the church in Smyrna and says, you're my winners, you're my trophy. And the picture of Jesus and his bride each wearing crowns is just so tender. And I'll say this, transparently, I don't know why. I don't know the mind of God. But I'm thankful for this man who in our men's discipleship class, he said a statement one time, Pastor Chuck did. He said, I don't know the whys of God, the W-H-Y apostrophe S. But I do know enough to know this, that where the Bible is silent, I'm going to be silent. I'm not going to speculate or put words in God's mouth. I don't know why the suffering or the implications of all these crowns, but I do know that the Bible speaks of crowns in heaven. I do know that what you do on earth for the kingdom matters. It matters. It's not like being a Christian is just about experiencing the saving grace of God and then just you just kind of live life. Someone once told me this, and you've heard me say this many times, that the grace of God is like a loaf of bread and salvation is the first slice. He gives you grace for today to do the work that he's called you to do. And it's like he's saying, there's going to be chocolate at the end. Like there's crowns. Now, how's that all going to work? In Revelation, we're going to see that we're laying down our crowns. I have no idea. But I do know this. Let me read 1 Corinthians 9. Paul would put it this way. Don't you realize that in a race, everyone runs? Thanks, Paul. Thanks for pointing out the Captain Obvious stuff. Yes, everyone runs. We got that. But only one person gets the prize. Yeah, we get that. So run to win. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away, but we do it for an eternal prize. So I run with purpose in every step. I'm not just shadow boxing. I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. This is what I do know. Life is short. Eternity is not. Rewards are real. Don't compete with others, but complete your race. That's what I know. That what you do today matters. It matters. And we are not not in competition with one another. We're not to compete, but to complete our own race. That's what we're to do. I'm running the race that God has for me. And good runners know how to pace themselves. It doesn't just mean, well, I'm just going to kill it. Here we go. See, life is short. We know that. But in some ways, at least, let's put it in the 100-year frame. Life can be a little bit long, right? Right? Like you can sow a seed and go, well, no fruit yet. I can wait. There's balance in that. 
You see, and lastly, we'll finish out this, this section to the, the book of uh, in the church in Smyrna in verse 11. After Jesus has given this encouragement, he gives a comfort. In verse 11, he says, to those that are victorious, you won't experience the second death. In verse 11, anyone with ears to hear must listen to what the Spirit says and understands what he's saying to the churches. Whoever is victorious will not be harmed by the second death. If you read Revelation 20, verse 14, and 21, verse 8, you see that the second death is the lake of fire. And even though Satan threatened and attacked their lives, Jesus promises this. Death is conquered for you. You've heard this old statement, if you're born once, then you'll die twice. But if you're born twice, you'll only die once. You know, I spoke with someone last week that had some questions about the dynamic sometimes, it seems, in Scripture of either losing or leaving your salvation. That's a wonderful topic to open as we close the sermon, right? But here's what I want to say about that. If you don't profess today that Jesus is Savior and Lord of your life, and profession is not just through words, it's through who you are. If that's not your profession, well, the way Chuck Smith used to tell us, and this is how he trained me, don't ever give anyone some assurance of faith for something that they're not professing to have faith in. Why would we do that? The Bible's very clear. Oftentimes it tells people, look, you need to get right with the Lord. And this is what he's saying. I've conquered sin, death, and the grave. I want you to know that I know what you're going through. And I want you to not fear. And to rest in this promise that anyone with ears to hear must listen and understand what he's saying to the churches. For whoever is victorious will not be harmed by the second death. Stick and stay with Jesus. That's what he's saying. You don't earn your salvation. You know who earned it? Jesus. So I'm sticking and staying with that guy. That's who I'm with. And the second death won't touch me. See, the Smyrna church was poor and persecuted, imprisoned, persistently persevering, and promised life forevermore. And as we go through challenge in following Jesus, we need to remember the compassion of Jesus. I know, that's what he says. May we not forget the position and the power of Jesus. He's the first and the last, the one that was dead and now alive. May we not forget his promise that life is short, eternity is not, rewards are real. So today, don't compete. Complete the race that God has for you. And fourth and finally, this is how Jesus loves his church. He's tender here with his church. But he also doesn't shy away from tough stuff. Like when they're about to go through suffering, he says, I know, don't fear. I want to give you the promise of life forevermore. You see, as we continue to gather on Sunday mornings and even group together, I pray that we as a congregation would learn and live this truth that Jesus loves church. 